beginning of life, which is to revisit neonatal life. The goal is Leo and I are going to share some spiritist teachings, and then Julio is going to, you know, enchant our hearts and minds with his beautiful voice and uh, the teachings that he's going to share with us about the major topic, which is in defense of life, it's not a political viewpoint, it's mostly um, a way of understanding life. Because we in spiritism, we don't have dogmas. No, we don't, right? Do we? No, we don't. Everything goes through our reasoning. And uh, if it makes sense, if it's logical, we buy into that. If a science is also walking in parallel, then we are um, walking together. Otherwise, dogmas are not really for any of us. The same for revisiting the day we were reborn. Can you remember the day? No? Can you remember the day? Is it possible to perceive things when we are in our mother's womb? Is it possible? What does psychology say? Interesting enough to know that psychology tells us nowadays that we can perceive and register everything that is happening around within the mother's feelings in the womb, but also the environment around. I have personal accounts, and I know of other accounts of people who actually did spontaneous uh, prenatal uh, regression therapy, and they describe scenes with tones and uh, colors and so vivid in emotions as well. When they go back and check with parents, they are amazed, and they ask, how do you know? Who told you about it? You just know. But where do they, where are these memories lying inside of us? So this is what we're going to talk about today. There was a guy, this was a uh, case that was studied by the Medical Spiritist Association in Brazil. And uh, the Medical Spiritist Association was treating a case of a man who was 40 years old. He was an engineer, a single man. And he had recurrent episodes of depression. And his life wasn't, was pretty much stuck to the level that he couldn't really function well, work well, have no relationships, etc. So he got to know the possibility of doing past life regression. Of course, he found a good person, a good therapist, because that's something. Uh, that you need to, uh, to do and to be safe in the process of therapy. And uh, once there, he found out that twice before he was actually reborn in that life, twice he was aborted by his own mom. She committed two abortions and the third time she got pregnant of him, he was born. But consequences, he had asthma, pneumonia, etc. And he could recall how abortion happened during the regression. It was very traumatic. And then we learn with the medical spiritist therapists that these are some of the conclusions that they show us that actually uh, intra uterine traumas may happen mostly they may happen because every trauma is by definition a distortion of the perception of the real fact which is very interesting because usually when we get traumatized by anything we feel like victims but why should we feel like victims if, in fact, we are interpreting a fact and not necessarily taking the fact as is? So the trauma can be re-elaborated because, by definition, you distorted it and then you can rearrange it and recover from the, the trauma. So in this case, they said the trauma that he suffered 
like many who underwent the procedure of abortion as spirits who were reincarnated, they uh, undergo the threatening elements, which are, which are the mother's emotional life, not necessarily only the physical invasion, but mostly, as Andrea Lewis says in the book Action and Reaction, the exchange of thoughts and feelings between the mother and the baby, the in unconscious messages that I don't accept you, I don't want you, I reject you. Those feelings, they become transduced into traumas depending on the previous relationship between mother and the reincarnating spirit. Not only that, but they also pinpoint that the, also another threatening element will be the mother's physical and psychological needs when they are ignored. For example, mothers who are pregnant and they engage into partying all, you know, every night and drinking and being promiscuous, etc., etc. So that can also affect, you may be asking, but Vanessa, what about the father? Usually we think fathers don't do much. They have a big role in this. How many times we're going to see that the vibrations of the father and the connection with the father and the baby still in the womb can affect the way the baby is feeling and perceiving the reincarnating experience. So telling you about this, the question now for us is, so for us in spiritism, is it a problem? to have the free will to choose to end a life in the womb or not. Many will say, what about the law of freedom? We are free, for sure. That's why on and off we say to spiritist friends, politically speaking, should we say we are pro-life or pro-choice? Probably both. Because we are pro-choice 100%, because pro-choice in the sense that the mother has a choice and the free will to choose. But whether or not it's the most appropriate procedure, then we take the other position of being pro-life. Because now we're going to see the reasons why, although we may have the choice in our hands, not necessarily what we can do, we should do. So. Let's revisit. How does the spirit get connected? How do we get connected to this physical body when we were about to reincarnate? Let's revisit it together. Revisiting it because major psychological uh, effects may happen to those who decide to commit abortion. These are true statistics that were brought by uh, this website, afterabortion.info. And this is not the only one, but it shows clearly that 44% of the women who committed abortion, they have nervous problems. Nervous disorders mean depression, anxiety, stress, and many other types as well. 36% usually experience sleep disturbances. So life changes after the decision of quitting that uh, life to come. And 31% uh, regretted about their decision. 11% pres were prescribed uh, psychotropic medicine, meaning psychiatric medicine. 19% of post-abortion women suffer from PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a very physiological disorder because it's quite, um, uh, you don't actually process it. You actually get to block sometimes yourself from continue to work, continue to live a normal life, sometimes getting going places or visiting family and sometimes going to open spaces and 60% of women who experience post-abortion sequelae report suicidal ideation so they start thinking about should I quit like 60% of the 
of women who make a, the decision of committing abortion start thinking about taking their own lives. It's a very high number, very high. And of those, 28%, which is almost half of their number, actually attempt suicide. So we're talking about something that is really beyond just such simple choice. It's beyond just saying, I'm free to choose and proving that I own my body and whoever is coming in needs to be under my decision. It's about something that probably has underpinnings that people don't know. And that's when the spirit of science comes and explains what's on the behind the scene so we can understand why these effects may happen. Why the guilt and what to do. I didn't bring this slide, but we like to share that there is a foundation, more important than saying it's right or wrong, but when people make that decision, what to do next? We're not going to talk about it today, but there is a foundation in the United States, if you Google it, a foundation for women who committed abortion and now want to live a fulfilled life knowing that they probably regretted it. And uh, this foundation helps them either overcome the scenario or prevent the scenario from actually unfolding. So let's see what Spiritism says. Where does the union between ourselves, spirits, we are souls, we are spirits, we are not this physical body here. We may be beautiful, but it's not us, right? It's not us. We love it, we respect it, we take care of it, but it's not us. Where does this connection between ourselves and the physical body begin? At this very moment. When, when is it? It begins when we are around the future parents, everything is pre-planned, like the case of Orino. Orino was a true account that was told uh, through the mediumistic hands of uh, Divaldo Franco in the book that is not translated yet, as many other ones, Entre uh, Dois Mundos, Between Two Worlds. And the spirit, Manuel Filomeno de Miranda, he shares with us the beautiful account of how precisely Orino spirit form gets to be reincarnated. And here we see our own history, the history of each one of us. They say that Orino knew his parents before he got into the flesh of the new body. Number one, there's no chance. Oh, well, some spirit just appeared and took the new body over. No, it is planned. There is a relationship. There is a reason why we're being born in that family. Not only there, that, but Miranda shares with us that Orino in spirit form was allowed to come and acclimate himself into the new family. Visiting, meeting the parents during sleep time, talking, and then one day, one day, the mentor's assistants got to the point where finally the spirit is going to be connected with the body. So what did they do? They did a preparation. What we call here, a spirit doctor named Germana was assigned to apply special, en special energy therapy onto Orino. His very spirit reduced to a newborn size. For those who are not familiar with it, very spirit means spiritual body. And what we're talking about here is the fact that even in spirit form, we need a spiritual body, although we're not incarnated yet. And that needs to be reduced. And that's when many of our, our memories get compressed, just like computer. That's why, like, I don't recall anything anymore. Why? Because before we reincarnate God's mercy, those files are compressed. There's no need to remember. If something comes up spontaneously, God bless, we're going to work on it. But if it doesn't, we don't need to search for it unless it's necessary. When they did that procedure, Orino in spirit form already 
was in a sleep state. He was not fully aware of what's happening. Then he's taken hand in hand to the next step, which is, now let's picture it. Mother and father had a relationship. The spirit mentors, of course, they don't go there, right? Until the right time. The sperm cells are traveling around. These are true. This is a true image from a scientific journal showing it's a fluorescent image of um, sperm cells, and they are traveling. And the question is, often we think the strongest, the fastest, is going to get there first. Is that the rule? Not necessarily, because science cannot explain why this one gets there and not the other one. They don't know yet, not the ins and outs. So in this case, the spirit of science unfolds the teaching that the mentor, the spirit doctor, touched Orino's crown chakra, which is here, and induced the dislocation of a powerful mental wave. From whom? From Orino's mind. And that wave entered the uterus of the future mom, reached a specific sperm cell, and then the impulse of that energy gave new speed to that sperm cell, which won the race into conception. So the one which won the race is the one that, magnetically speaking, matches the needs of the reincarnation of that spirit. So there is no chance. So when people talk about, oh, I gave this disease to my child, that's not true. Because the child actually, genetically speaking, attracted that set of genes. Mm -hmm. It's like we have a magnet inside of our minds. We attract what we think. We attract what we need, not necessarily what we deserve, but what we need for the growth and the experience. And when Miranda says that, he wraps it up by saying that that specific sperm cell, which is this one, the winner, contained the paternal DNA that needed elements for Arena's physical constitution in conjunction with the maternal ovule. Form the first cell. Aurina is connected to the egg. That moment, there is life. From that moment on, zero hour, there is life. If I cut the links, what am I doing? I'm killing someone. Really? Yes. Because there is a spirit connected to that just beginning to form body. This is not a judgment. It's just the rationale of everything. So we in spirit is we don't say you shouldn't. When you understand this, conclusion is natural. Then abortion then is a no-no. That's what it is. And But we don't, don't judge because if we didn't do in this life, very likely we did this in previous lives when we didn't and we were not aware of it. To share two more points on this, so we wrap up this. During the time that we are connected to this new growing body, mother and son have such intermingling of their energies that we could say the mother becomes the medium of the reincarnating spirit, feeling things, willing to eat, and to do things that she never thought before. And in this book, um, Entre a Terra e o by Andrea Lewis, Through the Hands of Chico Xavier, he says that a reincarnating spirit named Julio, through the mom, Zulmira, I know the name sometimes besides Julio's names, which is very easy to, to say, but Zulmira, this mother and son-to-be, they had a relationship of the past in which, because of her in the past, Julio committed suicide. 
committed suicide by taking a poisonous um, substance. So then, during pregnancy, she experiences what we call tonsillitis. And why is that? Andrea Louis shows it to us, that she's experiencing that disturbance as a consequence of her connection with the traumatic area that Julia was experiencing in spiritual body. Meaning that the connection between mother to be and the reincarnated spirit is very close together because peri spirit to peri spirit are connected. So if I quit my pregnancy, then I'm doing something to myself too because we are interconnected. So it's not about killing someone else's life. It's about my own life that is interconnected with that life. So the bottom line is that mother and child actually share thoughts and feelings. Since when? Even before the first cell is connected to that spirit. And one influences the other in such a way that in this other book by Andrea Luis, Evolução em Dois Mundos, Evolution into Worlds, we're going to learn something very interesting. At the vanguard of the thought of humanity, which is the understanding of miscarriages, Andrea Luis shares that there are two reasons why a woman may experience miscarriage. One, maybe because the mother consciously or unconsciously rejected the reincarnating spirit, or the reincarnated spirit was afraid, not willing to be born. When we talk about all this, the conclusion is the life to come had to undergo a preparation to be here. Who are we to go there and just make a decision that is not even ours? Because no matter the sexual, sexual intercourse, Conception, fecundation is only going to happen according to major, the major law of God. If that is so, then should we just go there and end that life? We would say no. And not only that, but we would say pregnancy is more than anything else, a spiritual service. More than just uh, how many women say, I'm going to have a child because I'll feel, be fulfilled, or it's like a certificate of adulthood, or any other reason, it's in fact oh, an opportunity for us to serve God by taking care of the new life. This is the beginning of our lives. Now Leo is going to come and tell us about when life ends, and how we should understand the end of our lives in euthanasia. Thank you, Vanessa. With all this information, we see how precious life is. With all this information, we see how important it is for us to um, cherish life, cherish the opportunity that we have to be together, to be among friends, family members, and have this chance to continue have the chance to perhaps, as Vanessa says, to acquire um, or to be reborn with diseases, difficulties in our lives that we have to face that perhaps not anybody else asked for or we asked. Um, it's a fact that we all go through that this body that we have one day will perish and we'll go through difficulties that some will perhaps go through some hardships and some other ones will pass by to back to the spiritual life, which is the real life we have to exalt that um, in a more uplifting way, a more easier way. With that in mind, we'll then explore a little bit about the reality of um, euthanasia with the spiritist glasses, if we will. We'll undergo a little bit of understanding um, who is involved, who is not involved, and then we'll give some more understand get some more understanding as we analyze the spirit thoughts about it. With that in mind, I would like to explore a little bit more about this man 400 years before Christ. Christ. Hippo the Hippocratic Oath by Hippocrates, 
when he puts together this uh, set of codes, set of uh, ideals, if you will, to help others, to, um, as a doctor, to truly dedicate ourselves, um, as educator perhaps, sometimes too, um, towards others, towards life. Obviously, the oath is pretty long. I'm not gonna, uh, we're not going to discuss the whole thing. But we're, we're, we would like to just exalt this part right here, where he invites everyone to say that I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody who asks for it, nor will I make a suggestion for the, to this effect. Similarly, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. In purity and holiness, I will guard my life and my art. Once more, inviting everyone to who practice medicine, who practice um, the care of others, um, to not do anything that we may regret later on. As Vanessa has um, exalted that life is precious from the beginning, perhaps they even before the times that the woman and the wife, the man and the wife, gets together have that moment of intimacy, it's way beyond that, it's way beyond that moment. But we're not here only to analyze the side of the doctor who may give a drug or a deadly poison to someone. We're here to analyze the whole picture. We're here to analyze the sick person who nowadays in this Christian, if you will, but very materialistic, um, moments that we're living our lives, we are trying to look for um, easy or very fast ways to uh, solve our problems. When it comes down to uh, deadly diseases um, that we have to face sometimes, that perhaps medicine yet hasn't discovered ways for it to um, make it easier for ourselves um, or perhaps cure ourselves. And we are the ones that are going through and we can't really face the problem, and we want um, a fast and quick solution. So it becomes a solution, okay, what should I do? Do I want to go through chemotherapy if I'm going, if I have a, um, a certain type of cancer? Do I have to go through uh, certain procedures that really uh, make it painful for me? And we want the easier way out, thinking that we'll solve our problems. It doesn't stop there when also we analyze the family members that are around us. The family members are around those who are going through those trouble. We're not here to say that it's easy. We're not here to say that it's a pleasant moment as we are seeing <laughs> in this picture. But just to, uh, just to remind ourselves that we are all involved. As Vanessa said, the mother and the son, they're involved with thoughts and feelings. We're all, all involved, we're all connected somehow with the with thoughts and feelings that we're emanating with one another here, imagine those who were reincarnated uh, as family members. So they're also responsible. They're also responsible to make certain choices in that case. And many times we choose to, as they say, to pull the plug, to do something that we may regret later on. If we analyze with certain eyes, as we will see later on. As we already have seen it, the doctors also um, exposing their ways of compassion and their compassionate feelings say, that, you know, this person or this poor individual don't, don't have to go through this tough time, we then um, need to make a decision. They invite the family sometimes, family members, and, or they make the decision themselves, as um, we will be analyzing later on. But it also, in many other ways, in many other aspects of this equation, it can also become as we, um, we see nowadays, an economic issue as well. Why keep someone alive that is perhaps in the vegetative um, stage? Why keep someone in that position? Why keep that poor individual in that suffering stage? So we ask ourselves, and we can go on and analyze more and more deeply um, this equation when then we see religions, um, uh, sects, talking about the same case that we're talking here tonight about euthanasia. Kardec, in the 1800s, asked the same question because this was already a problem then. 
The same way um, Hippocrates, Hippocrates um, created the oath um, trying to analyze the case with his students, whoever came to follow the ideals, uh, noticed the same thing. The problem continue, and it continues, and it's in our hands nowadays. And Kardec asked the question, is it wrong on the part of him who finds himself exposed to some terrible and inevitable death to shorten his sufferings by killing himself? And the Spirit wisely says, it is always wrong not to wait the moment of dissolution appointed by God, the same who have given us the opportunity to reincarnate. Besides, how can a man tell whether the end of his life has really come or whether some unexpected help may not reach him at what he supposes to be his last moment? Joanna the Angelis on the, in the book, uh, After the Storm, reminds ourselves that these are the moments that perhaps that many doctors are afflicted and they're working, um, thinking and perhaps really studying ways to solve some of these physical problems that we have nowadays. And science have taken a huge step towards several of these diseases. If we analyze it, perhaps, um, I would say just go back 30 years ago, how many troubles we have fixed to how many troubles that we have um, before that now it's curable, how many diseases is now curable. So it's amazing that perhaps one hour, one day, a month, a year, we may have a solution for the problems that we think is incurable. With this thought in mind, not trying to point fingers, not trying to um, uh, really uh, point out who is at fault in this, we're here to analyze the, spirit, it's the spiritist um, view on this whole thing. And that's where we bring a case of um, Cavalcanti. From the book, The or Workers of Eternal Life, the passage of, about Cavalcanti develops on uh, chapter 18 of the book, where they expose uh, his condition, which was very critical in the stomach area. He had several problems uh, that he was developing. He was in a really bad stage where... Um, there was nothing else that it could be done at the time for him in the physical realm, in the physical, in the matter, through the, uh, for the matter. And he found himself um, asking for clemency and asking for um, help in many ways. He wanted to see his wife, who had left him years and years ago, not knowing that she had discarnated already. And one night... Just to, uh, it, just to present a little bit the, uh, the case, he um, asked for the help of a priest who was at a hospital with him. Well, at the hospital, at the chapel of the hospital, uh, that specific moment. The, the priest came by and not knowing what to say, just told him to believe in God and continue that he was a strong man and he would come out of that situation. He kept asking, insisting, um, afraid of what, what was to come that he didn't know. Uh, to discover what was going to happen to him. And uh, he kept asking, insisting, insisting. And the priest got then pretty discouraged. And he was really put, pushing him away. You'll be okay. You'll be fine. And left. Obviously, the spirits, the spirit mentors with Andrea Lewis, then trying to resolve the case, trying to analyze the whole case, analyzed that the doctor was had thought about um, injecting him with some, something deadly that would take him out of misery. But before we go on on this passage, I would like to remind, as Vanessa already um, um, presented to us, that we are not just this body. We are not just this precious thing that we see here. We're not just the clothing that we're um, wearing tonight. We are spirits. We're millionaire spirits that we bring with us this whole carriage, the whole baggage that we have with us that, as Vanessa said, we're compressed, we are compressed, all this information is compressed as we reincarnate. We have this perispirit body or this astral body that we need, spirit, need to connect with matter. And this body is the connection that we have between the physical, the spirit and the physical body. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to connect. Because this body right here, the perispirit, is semi-matter. There is no way for a spirit just to connect it straight to 
um, the physical body. So we need this body, the perispirit. There, um, this body is also constituted with of molecules of cells that perhaps for our eyes we can see it, and it is this body that connects with these cells that we can see, this physical, this matter that we can touch and feel in the physical realm. Going back to the story, as the gentleman, the doctor, came and injected the deadly poison in, on Cavalcanti um, to take him out of, out of misery, not to say otherwise, not to say other things, that though that, that poison not only um, affected the physical body, but also affected the perispirit, the molecules that constitute the, that body, the cells that constitute that body. So we see that it's beyond the, just this physical body. And what happens? What happens in that moment? As we're going through that tough time that we already analyzed, we are being helped being helped by our mentors, being helped by the mentors of the hospital that is that we are being attended, helped by the mentors of our family members as well, who wish as well. So there's a whole work. The same way there's this, this preparation for us to reincarnate, there is a huge preparation for us as well to discarnate. In this moment, we're able to analyze what we have done, what we didn't do, what we must have done as well during the lifetime, Hence, many times we see individuals um, recollecting, saying things that, you know, passed many, many years ago. Hence, sometimes individuals, they connect and they start seeing um, family members who already passed. It's that moment that we are having, that we are, again, liberating ourselves from this physical body and entering back the real life. We can be here the whole night explaining with our own words. We can be here um, and, and, and analyze the whole thing, but we would like to bring the passage uh, of the book that summarizes what happens at that moment and what happens um, when such a thing happens, such an act is taken. And once more, the book, um, Workers of the Eternal Life. The mentor then says that within the inf inf infinist infinitesimal infinitesimal field of cellular nuclei, any drug is felt according to its specific electric properties. Combining chemical applications with the physical, the physiological need will in fact compromise, comprise of medicine in the future. Doctors will discover that all medicines are saturated with electrical magnetic energies in their, in their are I'm sorry, in their act of actions. I'm so sorry about that. That is, that the poison destroys the viscera and the narcotics modify, and narcotics modifies the nature of the, cell themsel the cells themselves, forcing them to become temporarily incapacitated. Each drop of medicine has electrical principles, as do the atomic combination they are going to observe it. To our knowledge, on one plane, on no plane, does nature progress in le leaps and bounds. The perispirit made up of verified matter likewise activates trillions of unicell unicellular units from our realm of action. Once more, just to remind ourselves about the cells of the perispirit. These abandons the physical field saturated with the vitality that is unique to them, hence the suffering and anguish experienced by certain individuals after their physical death. Suicides usually feel for, felt for a long time the affliction of the cells that were violently annihilated, while drug addicts experience terrible anxiety due to their unsatisfied cravings. This is just for us to um, portray or show um, a little bit deeper what happens to us. The individuals who were connected before gets more con connected to the situation now more than ever because we have our free will, but also we have responsibilities towards, we have to have responsibility towards our acts. That individual who actually made that decision, it's automatically, that person is automatically an open door 
for um, those obsessive agents or individuals that the person who is suffering uh, may have. That individual who makes, who is going through this tough time, the sick person, who opens themselves for this opportunity, for this option, also connect with these minds, these negative minds who does not wish us well at all. The family members, the same way. So we all inter interconnected again now in a not so positive way um, that we could have. And we will be feeling, the cells will continue to feel uh, the sensations of that moment. A spirit with the perispirit body will still continue to feel, the, the, in many situations, the sufferings that we had. So is it correct or is it right to take such action towards ourselves sometimes? Once more, we could be all in the same situation in the future. Uh, the body will perish. With that in mind, with that question in mind, will repentance may save them from many tor torments. The materialistic, who only sees the body and does not take in consideration the spirit, is not apt to understand these things. But the spiritist, who knows what happens in the afterlife, comprehends the value of these last thoughts. So mitigate the last sufferings as much as you can, but guard yourself against abbreviation, abbreviating life, be it even for a minute, as this minute can be the means for avoiding many tears in the future. This is a well-evolved spirit, giving us, giving us this uh, ideal of cherish that moment, cherish that suffering moment. Once more, we're not here tonight to point fingers, to make decisions, or to say who is right, who is wrong, but to invite us all, um, as we are interconnected, to help one another to really spiritualize matter um, and analyze our thoughts, analyze what we want. This is also um, um, a way for us to understand when we have our little sufferings in our lives, the little things that sometimes bothers us so much and we want to take action and want to seize that problem instead of facing it, instead of going through with friends, with family members, and most importantly with God. So we hope that this may be a chance for, for all of us to call upon ourselves and help one another and truly see these moments as a moment of endurance, a moment of um, growing, uh, spiritually speaking, because that's what we're here for. And that's what Jesus um, taught us to face the difficulties. Didn't Jesus really invited us to um, help the blind ones, the ones that had physical problems? He never really went... Um, he did too, but he never really just went to the ones who had no problems. He went to help those ones who had problems. Because they, he, he knew that at those moments, we were liberating ourselves from the sickness that we had created in the past. So with no further ado, we would like to pass our word back to Vanessa.